You're all very welcome to a slightly belated launch of Professor Anki Mukherjee's Unseen City, The Psychic Lives of the Urban Poor, published in Cambridge Studies in 21st Century Literature and Culture. As we have series editor Peter uh, Boxall on our panel, I keep these comments brief and Peter will do the heavy critical lifting, exactly how a series should work, in my opinion. The book is now available after the by now routine 21st century supply problem, so I uh, hope you can see it. It's a fantastic cover and um, great to have it just in time. Anki is Professor of English and World Literature at Wadham College, Oxford. Her first book was Aesthetic Hysteria, The Great Neurosis in Victorian Melodrama and Contemporary Fiction. Her second, What is a Classic, Postcolonial Rewriting and Invention of the Canon, asked how classics emanate from postcolonial histories. The book's ambitious historical schema included South Asia, Africa, the Middle East, the West Indies, Australia, New Zealand, Europe, and North America. What is a classic won the British Academy Rosemary Crochet Prize in 2015. Three fundamental questions animate Unseen City. One, can a humanistic study of mental illness in poor populations contribute to a fuller understanding and eventual alleviation of urban poverty? Two, what role does literature play in the transmission of psychoanalytic procedures between metropolitan centers and a variety of poor urban sites? Three, how does psychoanalysis negotiate race and cultural difference? Anki examines these questions in six global cities, Mumbai, London, New York, Kolkata, Bangalore, and Delhi. The project immediately excited a CUP publisher, for it could have been published in several areas of our list. In our series, Cambridge Studies in War Literature and Culture, as a freestanding monograph at the intersection of psychoanalysis, race, and the city, or in our 21st century literature series. I'm afraid that's the kind of thing that excites uh, a CUP editor. But underlying the book is the principal belief that humanistic endeavor can have a public role and impact. It's a project that stretched everyone, the readers of the script, our list, our series remits, and established definitions of literary critical practice. One of the reasons we settled on our 21st century series was because when I called Peter uh, Boxhall to say that there's a new book from Anki Mukherjee called The Psychic Lives of the Urban Poor, I swear I heard him purr. In 2023, we'll publish a collection called Decolonizing the English Literary Curriculum, edited by Anki and Adam Quayson. We hope it'll be a major event for the profession. And I haven't even mentioned her book after Lacan, the first in a new series and re reviewed in the TLS. <laughs> Rare is the scholar who in successive books addresses such fresh, separate and major critical topics. Anki never settles for the lower critical branches. For all she has brought to the CUP list, she has our gratitude and admiration and she has my affection too. We're delighted to have this book in C21 and to be able to celebrate it and her tonight. Let me introduce the distinguished panel who help us do that, and I have to rattle through them because they're so distinguished. Neil Altman is a psychoanalytic uh, psychotherapist, clinician, and author of The Analyst in the Inner City and Psychoanalysis in Times of Accelerating Cultural Change. He is faculty member at William Allison White Institute in New York. Peter Boxall, professor of English at Sussex, is the author of many influential works on modernist and contemporary writing, including The Prosthetic Imagination, A History of the Novel as Artificial Life, as published by CUP. And that's won the MLA's prestigious James Russell Lauer Prize um, at the most recent MLA. Peter is editor of the journal Textual Practice and editor of the book series Cambridge Studies in 21st Century Literature and Culture. He's an essential presence at CUP. Ranjana Khanna, Professor of English in the Literature Programme and Women's Studies at Duke, is author of Dark Continents, Psychoanalysis and Colonialism, and Algeria Cuts, Women and Representation, 1830 to the Present. Uh, Ranjana is currently Director of the John, Hop uh, John Hope Franklin Humanities Institute at Duke. Atto Quayson, Jean G. and Morris M. Doyle, Professor in Interdisciplinary Studies at Stanford, is the author of many books, including Oxford Street, Accra, City Life and the Itineraries of Translation, Transnationalism, and his most recent book is a CUP one, Tragedy of Postcolonial Literature, which won the Robert Penn Warren Clint Brooks Award. Uh, Addo was president of the African Studies Association in 2019 to 20, and he'll give the Isaiah Berlin Lecture at Wolf Wilson College, Oxford, later in May. I couldn't imagine our list without him. Helen Small is Merton Professor of English Language and Literature at the University of Oxford. Her The Long Life 2007 won major awards, including the Truman Capote Award for Literary Criticism. Other books include Love's Madness, Medicine, the Novel, and Female Insanity, 1800 to 1865, and The Valued Humanities, uh, 2013, both with OUP. What a brainy bunch of distinguished people. Enough of me, over to Neil. Okay, thank you very much, Ray. 
And thank you, Anki, for inviting me onto this panel and also for writing the book. And I think you're the, the best example I can think of for the maxim that if you want something done, ask a busy person. So um, I'll start out with some comments in the eight minutes that I have today. Uh, one of the things that I most appreciate about Anki's book is that it's interdisciplinary. And I think that, you know, the way that universities are organized works against interdisciplinary studies of anything. And so the fact that this is humanistic, but also clinical is, uh, is a special treat for me and especially illuminating because when it comes to psychoanalysis, which is my feeling, it's a multifaceted practice and a multifaceted discipline. And it looks different in an, in, in an interdisciplinary context. Each discipline shines a light on a different facet of what psychoanalysis is or can be. And so we get a special look at both psychoanalysis and cities and poverty and colonialism and post-colonialism and all of these things because of the special lens that the interdisciplinary context makes. So uh, to me, the title of the book is perfect. Unseen City. Why is it unseen? We're talking about the, the, the city that contains the colonized people and the people who are economically poor. And when I use the word poor, I always include a qualifier such as economically, because people who are economically poor very often are, are rich in other ways, in cultural ways. Um, but there are in a, in, a, in a neoliberal world, people who are economically poor are, are very often disturbing, especially if they're formerly colonized people, especially disturbing for, for those who are from the population that was the colonizer. And so the way that one, one of the things that psychoanalysis is especially illuminating about is the way that when something disturbs us, we tend to develop a blind spot around it and not to see it. And I think the conditions of life in the, in the inner city among economically poor people is something that creates a lot of, of tension for people who don't share that circumstance. And so they tend not to see it. And I myself, this is not, I'm not talking about somebody else, I'm talking about myself stepping over homeless people on the streets of New York, for example. Um, and so the, bl the blind spot is a, is a huge problem. And psychoanalysis, I think, is an ideal discipline for, for noticing the force field around blind spots, like, like black holes, where you can only infer that they're there because of the force field that grabs objects that get anywhere near them. So there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, force field around the blind spot that Anki has, has ventured into in this book. Um, it wasn't always this way with psychoanalysis. Freud encouraged the early analytic institutes to start free clinics and every psychoanalytic institute in the 30s, in the early and mid 30s, did start a free clinic. And that social consciousness that Freud had was actually annihilated by the Nazis who destroyed psychoanalysis in Europe and sent the, the analysts, many of whom were Jews, fleeing to other parts of the world. Many of them came to the United States and in the United States, the analysts, by and large, stayed away from the social world, having been traumatized by it in Europe. The analysts retreated into private offices 
and, and fell prey from my point of view to the seductions of the capitalist economy. And so psychoanalysis organized itself around the conditions of the private office with a wall between them and the social world. And that's why we end up in a place where we so need Anki Mukherjee's intrepid willingness to step outside of those walls that we all have in one way or another and look into the blind spot. So her, her book is full of inspiring examples, illustrations of people who have stepped into that breach that was created by psychoanalysts and many other people as well, uh, retreating from the social world and not wanting to look. So um, I'll just say one other thing. I have no idea how many minutes I've used up, but uh, I don't wanna run out of time here. So. Um, her book is inspiring in large part. I have two minutes. Okay. Um, her book is inspiring to me because of so many examples of people who are accomplishing amazing things in the quote unquote inner city. Um, focusing on people who are usually not noticed or marginalized. So I recommend it for that reason alone to anybody. Now, I also wanna say that an opportunity has opened up. I think her book is coming at just the right time because paradoxically, an opportunity has opened up for psychoanalysis to re-embrace the communities around it. And although the pandemic and, and the Black Lives Matter movement, police killings of, of Black people is uh, extremely tragic, it's also meant that psychoanalysts can't sit in their offices anymore. Suddenly, starting in 2020, the private office became untenable. And so at the same time, there were movements going on in different institutes around the US anyway, of, of thinking about how psychoanalysis could be taken out into the streets and into the world. Uh, there was a, a grant offered by a philanthropist in Portland, Oregon, just as the pandemic was starting to apply psychoanalytic perspectives to clinical work with undomiciled people in Portland. And since then, there's been an explosion of clinical projects all around the United States, sponsored by the American Psychoanalytic Association and now the International Psychoanalytic Association to see what community psychoanalysis, which sounds like an oxymoron on its face, uh, we're returning to Freud in that sense, because Freud was, was not against that. And, and he referred to possibly needing to, to alloy the pure gold of psychoanalysis. But I'll finish by saying that although I'm not a, a metallurgist, that alloys are sometimes stronger than the pure, the pure metal. And so psychoanalysis as an alloy and going out into the world is going to be a stronger force. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. H Helen. Thank you. It is such a pleasure to help celebrate the publication of this brilliantly original, politically committed and methodologically daring book. I mean, in part because of my own background and in part because of the condition under which I read it, uh, I've said to Anki that I will respond primarily to the idea, the goal of literary humanism as Unseen City defines and practices it. I've read the book just in the last few days and in the immediate aftermath of a conference in Lund, Sweden on the many faces of the humanities, the aim of which was to refresh, re-problematize the critical conversation around interdisciplinarity and the humanities conference ended with a frank conversation of the kind that Neil was just signaling to us about just how difficult it remains in 2022, even after decades of substantial government and philanthropic funding to identify work that genuinely combines the perspectives of the medical sciences, the social sciences and the humanities, and presumably also the sciences more broadly, when it's addressing the really intractable problems that our societies are facing, climate change, environmental degradation, war, the challenges of an aging population, security, food security, and then what the EU, in the context of this book, really blandly calls health demographic change and well-being. Mm -hmm. 
many of the papers in Lund had an explicit commitment, and I think all of them had an implicit investment in identifying the humanities as the potential broker in the room. The place where we go if we want articulacy and good reasoning about the ways in which the non-aligned practices of our disciplines can be made conversable, ideally synthesized rather than packaged, as the funding, funding bodies tend to say. More broadly, I'm struck by the frequency with which recent work in the humanities has had recourse to a phrase that originated in the social planning discourse of the early 1970s, wicked problems. It's germane to Anki's identification of how the unseen city escapes the vision of the rational urban planner, the urban cosmopolite, the colonizer, that the authors who coined wicked problems, Horst Rattel and Melvin Weber, were experts in architecture and city planning, interested in how information systems and evolved community models of urban development could provide a route through social problems that are endemic and that have no viable solution in view. We are, the humanities are, if many commentators inside and outside our field are to, believe, to be believed the experts, or we stand to make ourselves the experts in addressing the dilemmas for which there is no well-described set of actions or tests that might provide solutions. Where the trouble is presumed to be ongoing, ineradicable even, where every problem is a symptom of another problem, where we can't necessarily even agree on the causes, and where above all values clash and interests clash and communities clash care of the old it happens to be the domain in which I'm trying to think about this, but this book is absolutely articulating the problems uh, in view. So the promise to us is that we can be the brokers, we're told, because we have access to the vocabularies, the theories that allow us to compare values, identify sources of difference, describe psychological and emotional predicaments, the suffering, as well as the rational interests. It's quite a powerfully seductive idea of why we matter at a time when we're all too familiar with the ongoing pressures against investment in and recruitment to the humanities. I'm interested in how this very clever book at once invokes that promise to ourselves of what we might be and how it holds us up to us as indeed a very powerful potential seduction. I want to quote just one short passage from chapter two where Anki's setting out the history of improvisatory free clinics staffed by progressive psychoanalysts with a sense of social obligation to those for whom the standard roots of individual therapy were out of reach. She's partly quoting Penelope Crick, I should say. The clinic has a number of fantasy functions in the minds of different people. First, it's expected to reflect the charitable aims of the society. Second, it has an asylum function to contain disturbance, distress, unmanageable anxieties for next to no cost. Finally, I think, I think there's an element of, of deliberate calculated cynicism here. It's expected to provide a steady stream of patients with just the right amount of disturbance for training needs. Anki doesn't immediately comment, but if I read her right, this understanding of a fantasy of near costless solution and the hint of professional narcissism, also professional anxiety attached to the historic working of the free clinic at certain points is what takes her to her coinage of a portmanteau, a portmanteau word, psychomattering. Psychomattering gives a name to the non-end driven, experimental, interruptive, temporarily stressed forms of therapy that try to make a difference to the enormous mental suffering, the humiliation generated by social oppression. Many of the therapists and healers she discusses in the chapters are professionally educated according to established protocols. Very many aren't, they're vulnerable experts as she puts it, barefoot researchers, lay counselors, community-based mobilizers. Perforce pragmatic, they're not aiming at the sufferer's self-understanding. They're looking to alleviate the most immediately distressing and disabling symptoms. This is a book that puts a lot of pressure on some of the key areas in which medical humanities has a track record of valuing its contributions, narrative, perhaps most obviously. The novels and case studies that Anki is dealing with recognize the mess of mind and the mess of social and political circumstance as insoluble. The, tra the traumatic stresses they deal with as not retrospective, but ongoing, continuous, structurally entrenched, constantly repeating. So the book's close work readings work wonderfully to refine our vocabularies for doubling and equivocation, for thinkability rather than accountability, for taking a responsibility, as she puts it, rather than setting right. I have two questions for her. One is, what is the investment in narrative here? Since it's not an investment in narrative as explanation or accounting or justice, and she's acutely aware of, she gives us a lot of confronting examples of how humanism has historically tended to be narrowly self-serving in the stories it's told on behalf of culture. 
Does she want to retain the narrative function at all or replace it with something we might do better to call a bespoke psychomattering with words? I suppose I could rephrase that question to ask where the system resides. Is it in literary modernism and the techniques it gave us for reading? Is it in translation studies and the attention it's taught us to pay to non-commensurable but communicable experience? Is it a model of mind? One of the huge challenges currently facing the discipline that most of us on the panel present represent is the educational culture, is that the educational culture in which we're embedded seems to be increasingly relinquishing its captivation by long, long form narrative text as a popular mode. Elaboration and interrogation of story often becomes compressed in favor of image, rhetoric into something closer to indexicality. I'm being a bit cheap, but there's a pressure against long form narrative, even in the context of higher education, which makes this attention to short forms like the two paragraph case study or, or Teju Cole's bomb narratives of professional interest. So the second question relates to the first one. The book's hugely impressive in the model it offers for a form of literary criticism and political critique that combines close reading with theory, cultural and political history, field work. That field work is for sound reasons almost entirely work with the therapist or clinician or lay therapists rather than those who seek their help. It involves something that is and isn't akin to the educational work that we do and the at once institutionally regulated and deregulated process we call education. Unseen City was funded by the UK government and by private philanthropy, which is a very good thing. It was largely written at a time when the institutions of healthcare and education in all the countries that you're looking at Anki collapsed, at least temporarily, under the pressure of COVID pandemic. So the question is, are you happy to think of the pragmatic, stop making excuses, let's figure something out, activism you're applauding as a model? For press, are you happy to think of it as a model for pressing through the professional crises attributed to the humanities? Or are we in the grip of a fantasy there? And perhaps more than one. Thank you. Thank you. Peter. Hi, uh, yeah, um, to say that what an honor it is to be here to celebrate this book. So thank you, thank you for inviting me. And um, as Ray said, I first encountered this book in my capacity as series editor for CUP. Um, Ray heard of the book, I think from Laura Marcus, is that right, Ray, I, I think so. Uh, and he gave me a quick snapshot of it. Uh, the book was gonna rework the legacies of Freudian psychoanalysis, he said, by offering a transnational account of the ways in which psychoanalysis addresses or fails to address the, the real psychic lives of those living in economic poverty. Um, this was one of those moments that all editors cherish, I think, the moment when you glimpse an argument that you can see immediately is going to be transformative. So I immediately expressed my warm enthusiasm for the book. I don't remember purring, but that's apparently <laughs> what I did. Um, and I suspected then that the book would be something special, but nothing could have prepared me for the manuscript that Anki sent to me by email, the one that became Unseen City. Um, its power, its rigor, its originality were, were totally overwhelming. Um, it's immediately apparent, I think, on reading it that this is a life work. Uh, there's a lifetime in it of reading and of thinking and of experiencing. Its scope and erudition is breathtaking, as is its geographical reach. It blends philosophy with psychoanalysis, with literature, with field work. It spreads across the world, across cities, tracing connections and disjunctions between the world spaces that it inhabits, reaching out so much further than most books would dare to do. Um, this element of the book, its, its reach and its erudition is immediately apparent and no reader could fail to be struck by it. But the quality of the book that most compels me and that I'll try to address in these brief remarks is its capacity to conjure real political possibility out of a forensic attention to precise theoretical formulations. There is a brisk practicality to this book, which Helen has just captured, I think. It's propelled by an unfussy call to action. Early in the book, Anki quotes Leela Gandhi's demand that we should cobble together something out of the various elements of psychoanalysis that can serve a practical therapeutic purpose. The various elements of this assemblage, Gandhi writes, may not belong together, 
and will likely disaggregate once the job is done. But their surprising combination is effective, it makes something work, and innovative, it builds something new. And his book harnesses the combined resources of psychoanalysis and literature to produce such an assemblage, one which allows us to see past the barriers that operate between the psychic lives of the privileged and those of the, of the poor. This is not a naive or foolish endeavor, Anki insists. Quote, it is neither naive nor futile to challenge the damning prejudice that the poor may not have cognitive resources to sustain deep analytic work or the stratificatory prejudice which dictates that the chronic poor need immediate relief, not psychotherapeutic assistance, unquote. These are real and urgent demands, but in order to respond to such demands, the book undertakes theoretical work of the most finely honed kind in a way that seems to me to overcome what we might think of as a false distinction between theory and practice. To approach the fraught ground between the wealthy and the dispossessed requires the most thoroughgoing critique of the ways in which psychoanalysis and aesthetics have organized themselves along these socio-economic fault lines. It's the pressing task of an aesthetic education, Spivak writes, to imagine a kind of political possibility that is not contained within our existing analytical terms, a mode of being that, quote, can no longer be interpreted by such nice polarities as modernity or tradition, colonial or post-colonial. This claim from Spivak echoes through Anki's book. The refiguring of psychic life that she undertakes here requires us to remap the force fields that have situated political being, Spivak's nice polarities between centre and margin, between rich and poor, between abled and disabled. Unseen City, Anki writes, quote, enlists literary examples to illustrate the problem field of faulty psychological, psychoanalytical categories and provide ways of imagining these categories anew. This does not involve a, an apology for the tendency of Freudian psychoanalysis to replicate violent distinctions between mastery and subservience, between the civilized and the primitive. Rather, it draws on the language of psychoanalysis to fundamentally reconceive the terms in which psychoanalysis makes psychic life readable outside of those binaries that Spivak disavows, those binaries that can no longer make our contemporaneity visible to us. So Anki asked us to bring these remarks to a close with a question. And the question I'd like to ask relates to this perception that the task of the humanities today involves the reordering or remapping of our psychic categories. One of the oppositions that Spivak doesn't mention in the passage that Anki quotes, but that is perhaps the dominant binary in Anki's book is that between the inside and the outside of being, between interiority and exteriority. It's a claim commonly made both of psychoanalysis and of literary fiction that they allow us to see inside other people, to gain access to the deep psychic lives of others. To an extent, Anki's book sustains this claim. It's an aim of the clinics that Anki investigates to cultivate what she calls a rich and complex inner life over time in the modern psychoanalytical subject. But nevertheless, it's a recurrent theoretical imperative in the book to move past the opposition between the inside and outside of being that is foundational both to literary fiction and to psychoanalysis. Early in the book, Anki quotes Nicholas Rose's assertion that, quote, the interiority that is the stock in trade of psychological systems is best understood as a discontinuous surface an infolding of exteriority. The human material of modernity, Anki writes, is an inside formed by discourses outside. And so the question arises, how can we approach a psychic inside that is no longer framed in opposition to an outside through a theoretical language that is so heavily invested in the myth of psychic innerness? Anki's book, I think, is an extended address to that question. She reads the free clinic and a range of contemporary literatures to approach a space that is neither inside nor outside, 
a form of psychic life that might exceed the boundaries between subject positions that is a legacy of colonial architectures of knowledge. If I read her correctly, she doesn't only set out to draw on imaginative or analytic forms to salvage the inner lives of those who've been deprived of interiority, but also to rethink the terms in which we've constructed the fields of inner and outer lives, terms that have equated innerness with wealth and privilege. So at the risk of asking Anki to rehearse the entire argument of the book, my question is this, what does a rerouted relation between interiority and exteriority do to the therapeutic possibilities of psychoanalysis? What does it do to our understanding of the history of the novel? And what does it suggest about the ways in which we might rethink now the possibilities and stakes of an aesthetic education? Thank you, Peter. Um, Ranji? First of all, let me just congratulate um, Anki on this wonderful publication. It's just been so um, uh, fascinating to read different versions of it and hear different versions of it over the last um, few years. And um, thank you very much. It's really a, um, an amazing, an amazing book. Um, so I, I want to concentrate my um, comments on the question of poverty um, uh, also and to ask Anki uh, to expand a little bit more on the question of poverty. Anki's um, Unseen City, The Psychic Life of Poverty in Mumbai, London and New York is a wonderful account of the relationships, what I understand is the relationship among various modern, um, certain kinds of modern forms, the form of the city as a modern form specifically, um, the form of poverty in the city and psychoanalysis. Um, and, and also in relation to that, the meaning of poverty in cities. Um, it shows why a humanistic understanding of psychoanalysis is essential, underscores the need for an aesthetic education and also reveals the importance of adapted psychoanalysis for the poor as suggested by Freud and is expanded upon in different forms around the world um, in largely city-based clinics that are distinct from the mental asylums or psychiatric facilities that, 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 um, that may also be in those spaces. And the book takes us around the world to understand psychoanalysis relationship to poverty, the city form, I think, and writing of various sorts from the ethnographic to the fictional. She begins with, um, with uh, um, Marx at Norigere and more precisely Marx's criticism of Proudhon in the poverty, um, uh, Proudhon's po poverty of philosophy in which Marx takes Proudhon to task for not adequately situating poverty within a larger context of society, thus making of it a human constant rather than, for example, something that changes, something that is about the relations among classes of people um, in different places in the world, in the movement from feudalism to capitalism, arguably from the movement to also from the country to the city. And in the poverty, of psychoanalysis, Anki reminds us, um, uh, uh, Irigaray takes Lacan to task for um, producing uh, a psychoanalysis that apparently is existing in a vacuum. She writes, she quotes um, Irigaray, you refuse to admit that the unconscious, your concept of the unconscious did not spring fully armed from Freud's head that it was not produced at ex nihilo at the end of the 19th century, emerging suddenly to reimpose its truth on the whole of history, world history at that, past, present and future. Now, in, in, in addition to these, um, the, these, these, uh, the, um, the relationship um, uh, between Marx and Proudhon and Irigaré and uh, Lacan, we might also for a moment add to to those two pairs, E.P. Thompson's The Poverty of Theory, um, in response to Louis Althusser and particularly the final chapter of Reading Capital and the work more generally on the poverty of humanism. When Thompson writes, 
um, uh, criticizing Althusa. Um, and, and he, he, he says Marx does not only lay bare the economic processes of exploitation, but he also expresses or presents his material so as to evoke indignation at suffering, poverty, child labor, waste of human potentialities, and contempt for intellectual mystifications and apologetics. Now I bring this up because of, in that duo, of course, Althusser is the more psychoanalytically inclined, more the more psychoanalytically invested, um, and arguably um, the more multimodal, right? And I mean that is an argument that I'm sure Thompsonites might sort of take a different <laughs> to, to take issue with. Um, so, so my question, um, Anki, for you, it's not coming at the end of my comments, but in the middle. Um, uh, um, uh, my question for you um, is, um, is, is to uh, ask you whether there is a specifically psychoanalytic concept of poverty, right? Um, and the reason that I want to do this is partly because I'm following along a line of thought that I know that you've also been very interested in, in, um, in Derrida's essay, Geopsychoanalysis, where he takes psychoanalysts to task for actually quite a liberal understanding of torture in that context, when, 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 um, when he's analyzing the address um, to the psychoanalytic um, international um, uh, in Argentina. And I suppose what one of the things he says is that actually their sympathy, their understanding um, and their liberal response to torture actually doesn't really adequately grapple with the psychoanalytic um, understanding of cruelty, of harm, of uh, self-preservation, of the death drive, um, uh, i.e., in his words, to have a truly psychoanalytic understanding of torture. And so I suppose what I want to ask of you is to expand a little bit on what it might mean to have um, a truly psychoanalytic understanding of poverty. Now, I think that you you do do this in, in, in a variety of ways, and I'm just going to sort of sketch, sketch that out. You address, um, to begin with, um, for example, the number of ways um, in which, um, and you trace this through Kumar's essay that looks at the last 70 years of articles that are listed in the, um, in the PEP database, um, uh, um, the database we all love, um, that use the term uh, poverty, right? Um, and those range from things like um, uh, um, the impoverishment of ego in melancholia to poor people, um, people who are understood to be to be deprived um, in some way of the um, of the expectations um, of um, of. Uh, um, of, of housing, of adequate food, etc., in any in any given um, context, and you also address this, of course, very fast in a fascinating way through the spatial questions of slum, ghetto, homelessness um, for the poor, underscoring also, I think, how people like Vidler have under have, have thought through psychoanalysis as a city form as well, right? And one that reflects reflects a certain kind of understanding of the city um, as a modern entity um, in which psychoanalysis comes into being. Um, uh, I think also you go through various kinds of ideas of, um, of, of poverty that are, um, are in place. Sorry, I just got like a, a one, one more, one minute. Um, one um, uh, uh, that that, uh, that were in place when associated with um, with having a, a lack of interior life along the lines of the primitive being poor in the world in the Heideggerian sense, and I think also another sort of understanding of homelessness there homelessness is you know one 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 that one might think of in terms of the kind of pro post monastic. Franciscan's wondering of the highest poverty as discussed by someone like Agamben. So I'd just like you to address this question of what is poverty for psychoanalysis? 
um, and um, and 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 how does that play out in the um, in in the forms of um, uh, authorship also that we see in the literary texts that you you address? Thank you. Thank you, Atto. We have Atto. Thank you. Yes. Yes, we do. Uh, okay. Thank you, Anki, for this. Uh, magnificent offering is highly you know stimulating the lots of ideas as i was reading uh, i was reading it that uh, come to mind that connect to you know things that i'm also interested in but to other things now i have two comment questions uh, one has to do with uh, my reading of uh, the mumbai chapter three slums and the post-colonial uncanny uh, which, which is extraordinarily interesting because what you do with Freud's uncanny as a concept for looking at the slum, you know, starting from Slum Dog Millionaire and, and various other texts. However, the description of the slum, and I'm reading here from 105, uh, this is from, from the book, uh, page 105, the slum scenes with which the movie begins trot out the usual phobic configuration claustrophobic density, shit, standing water, communal riots, garbage hills, bulldozers, prostitutes and pimps, drug dealers, beggar mafia who blind kidnap children with a spoonful of acid to improve their street care. And this is your description of uh, Slumdog Millionaire, the various slum scenes. Now, the, the slum has a distinct spatial uh, order settlement pattern in many parts of the world also you know reveals another feature which is commonplace everywhere so commonplace are these features but also very commonplace is the fact that much domestic life is conducted out outside that is to say the nature of uh, of uh, the congestion and small abodes and so on forces a kind of a seeding of the domestic sphere to the outside. So cooking is done outside. I know from my studies of slums in Accra, cooking, shitting is done outside. We see it in Slum Dog Millionaire. Uh, sometimes sex, even if it's not done outside, is done either furtively or into the hearing of others. You know, so much of what I mean, we take for granted to be private or aspects of the domestic slash private sphere are ceded to the outside, the, to, to the thousand eyes. And this is, uh, you're quoting someone else, the thousand eyes that look over uh, the Daravi uh, uh, slum make it one of the safest places in the world. But precisely these thousand eyes also means that the domain of the private, and this is my first question, what does this do to the idea of the private, of the interiority? Do these uh, morphological features and their implications, the implications being that they force a conduct of domestic activities outside all the time in whatever weather, whether this uh, uh, as it were, obliteration of the boundary between inside and outside materially and physically within the morphology of the slum, whether it can register a, a residue in the psyche of the slum dweller. In other words, my question is to invite you to deploy a different concept from the uncanny, which works very well in the chapter, and rather to think of uh, in a way, I'm picking up, uh, uh, I'm echoing a little bit what uh, Peter said about interiority. But whether the slum, the morphology of the slum uh, reveals or suggests a particular uh, infrastructure of the interior. So, so, so that's my first question. Of course, you do, you, you, the slum is a central uh, motif in the book. So you return to the slum as a kind of placeholder for poverty, decrepitude, homelessness, and so on and so forth. Uh, ephemeral, transitional states, you know, the mention of bulldozers and so on. And so in the first uh, uh, 
uh, introduction chapter, you refer to Latif Tekin, his Bergy Christian Tales from the Garbage Hills, which I really love. I, I haven't read the novel before. No, it's a collection of short, short stories. So, uh, but, but from, from your account, it sounds extremely uh, fascinating. Now, of course, what you describe, the section that you describe is precisely of the fact of disposability. So this slum, the garbage hills slum, is, registers a form, forms of disposability. The fact that bulldozers are always in there, you know, uh, raising down their homes and so on, which makes them necessarily always uh, transitional or building or always trying to reprodu reproduce. And this takes me to my second question. Actually, I have two and a half questions. So my second question has to do with, in Slumdog Millionaire, the Slumdog uh, Millionaire also, apart from telling us a lot about slums, giving us lots of images, it also reproduces a, a, an aspirational matrix central to capitalism and neoliberalism, mainly the rags to Raja, rags to riches, the rags to Raja, uh, you know, the story of the slum dog. Now, so my second question is, what does the, how do the slum dwellers, given their psychic investment in survival, necessarily so, and the fact that the domestic sphere, the boundary between domestic and, and, and outside is uh, obliterated, how do they respond to the inherent falseness of this aspirational matrix? Because we know even, even non-slum dwellers know that that aspirational matrix, you know, American dream or American dreaming, rags to Raja, there's something <laughs> false in it. How, how do slum dwellers respond psychically to this invitation, which often ends up being false. My last question has to do with symptomatic reading. Now, the slum is one of your motifs, it comes up all the time, but the other motif is the uh, immigrant. Uh, and so in, in the chapter on, I, I believe it's chapter, chapter two, uh, Salman Rushdie, you, you reference Salman Rushdie's novel, novels and you're particularly interested in the, you know, Saladin and his perambulations in, in London. But you pick up this uh, idea also in chapter five, where you discuss um, Teju Cole and uh, uh, Howie Hajj, his novels, a cockroach. Now, this is my question. Let me zero in straight because I, I noticed I've got notification. I have one minute. What is symptomatic reading for you? Now, some novels lend themselves to a symptomatic reading of illness more readily than others. Examples, Toni Morrison's Beloved. Everyone knows that when you read Beloved, you know without much effort that this is full of illness. Or, uh, you know, uh, Beckett Murphy, which is a, a text, I think, uh, assemblative of autism. So some texts deliver this more readily than others. But the ones that you choose is not so obvious. If, if someone who had not been reading the, the, the text that you choose in relation to, to unseen cities, it is not obvious that these are texts symptomatic of illnesses. So my question is, what is symptomatic reading to you? Basically, it's for you to divulge to us your method of reading. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Uh, Anki, over to you to try and respond to that rich array of questions. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm breathless and speechless. I'm so very grateful for these tremendous sort of connection engagements with my work of a decade. And I'm also personally indebted to each one of you on the panel, uh, but I'll just name one person without the work of um, a person such as Neil Ortman, I don't think the book Unseen City would be possible. I really want to kind of, this is a shout out to the tremendous sort of vigilante activism that some uh, psychoanalyst in the community such as Neil Ortman has done, which has inspired me 
to kind of, you know, um, kind of want a seat at that table. Um, I just want to kind of um, read out a little bit and then I'll answer the questions. If I don't answer them right away, you, you please know that I will be answering them over weeks or months because they're very, they're, they're sort of very deeply ingrained in um, uh, the way in, I now think about some of the aspects of the book. Um, so I want to start with a very curious chapter in Sigmund Freud's life, um, his dealings with Cervantes' tale, The Dialogue of Dogs, uh, which was published in Exemplary Stories in 1613, and which the schoolboy Freud probably read in extract form in a Spanish primer. So Freud struck up a correspondence with his friend uh, Edward Silberstein between 15 and 25 years of age. They invented a Spanish academy and wrote to each other in Castellan. They also became the dogs that Cervantes had invented. So Freud was Scipio, he signed Scipion, so pronounced Scipio or, or Scipio, and Silberstein was Baganza. Scipio, like the pre-psychoanalyst Freud of studies on hysteria, asked questions and listened, while Baganza free associated and mouthed off. Both dogs were withering towards humans. The desacralized confessions on paper, Freud called them an encyclopedia of the past week, took place every Sunday. The letters set up a teller and a listener, just like in psychoanalysis. In Cervantes's novella, a soldier named Campuzano tells his friend about the colloquy of dogs he has overheard as he recovers from syphilis in a hospital. Scipio cajoles and coaxes his patient Baganza to recall the traumas and misadventures of his dog life. And the dogs speak all night at the foot of Campuzano's bed while they think he's sleeping. Cervantes' tale is thick with Freudian tropes, fantasy masquerading as reality, infants turned into animals, enchantment and transformation, the varied relationship of language with instinct and reason. As the witch Canizares says of transmogrification, this is a very matter of fact statement, everything that happens to us in our fancy is so intense that there's no difference between it and what actually and really happens. So Freudian psychoanalysis, as we know, not only started through correspondence, but was also imagined as correspondence, a transferential friendship that allows the speaker to free associate and that paves the way for the Socratic examined life. It's not an exaggeration to say Freud had found psychoanalysis in intimate epistolary exchanges with Silverstein, Breuer, Fleece, Jung, Ferenczi, etc. In this early example, the epistolary pact entails a secular confessional, and Freud, who determines the role play, also seems to be a stickler for form. To what extent we must adhere to the journal form must be the subject of special discussion between us, provided, of course, that you agree to the principle, I would advocate strict observance of the form. This is what the young Freud writes to his friend. E.C. Riley, one of the first critics to comment on the freud Silverstein correspondence says, Freud wanted effective, intimate communication. What mattered was the communication of friend with friend, the in-depth dialogue. The establishment of a comparable rapport would be the axis of psychoanalysis. The use of Spanish as foreign language in which neither boy was fluent is also telling and foreshadows, and Jean-Michel Rabaté has a wonderful essay on this, shows how the estrangement of language um, is kind of um, replicated in the psychoanalytic cure. So Rabaté says, Communication can be all the more intimate as it is mediated by another language, an idiom different from the mother tongue. So the reason I kind of like, you know, mentioned this, I read this out is when I'm asked what psychoanalysis means to me, I think of Freud's youthful experimentation, this one, as a working example. But certain inconvenient questions linger. Who are allowed to be correspondents in this scene of secular soul making? Who has the time and money to do so? How is effective intimate communication, to use Riley's phrase, achievable if one of the subjects is denied subjecthood and analyzability and is excluded, therefore, from the dyadic structure? Who is friend and, therefore, who must play the role of foe? I wrote Unseen City for nearly 10 years because I had some unfinished business with psychoanalysis which I have found very useful to think with and through in my day job as a literary critic. 
whether it is the gestural non-verbal language of hysterical sailors in Victorian nautical melodramas, or the repetition compulsion in post-colonial writing in English, or the dream relics in the writings of De Quincey, Coleridge, Wolfe, Du Bois, which foreshadowed the countermodern even as their industrial colonial societies were hurtling toward mechanized modernity. I found psychoanalysis an, a useful instrument to tally the said against the unsaid, the mind against the body, the psyche and soma of unconscious moments underpinning literary and cultural creation. The starting point of Unseen City, as um, several of you have mentioned, is this historical phenomenon called the free clinics, improvisatory structures which tried to mobilize an international mental health cooperative movement. Uh, two months before the armistice at the Fifth International Congress of Psychoanalysis in Budapest, Sigmund Freud famously um, uh, declared that the poor man should have just as much right to assistance for his mind as he now has to the life-saving help offered by surgery. And between 1918 and 1938, Freud's pronouncements on free clinics helped create a dozen health clinics from Zagreb to London. So these were free clinics, Danto says, literally and metaphorically. They freed people of, their, of destructive neuroses. And of course, like the municipal schools and universities of Europe, they were free of charge. So this was an eye opener for me, this generation of reformist, activist, psychoanalysts who wanted to claim the right to mental health care as a human right. And I wanted to, when I started out, I wanted to research the non-European history and afterlife of this movement, but it became a different book altogether when I started examining the translations of psychoanalysis at the intersection of race, class, and migration in different global cities. I thought I saw the through line between cultural understandings of poverty and the minds of the poor and the deficit in mental health provision for the same. I found it challenging as well as exciting that, you know, I could bring together cultural discourses and mental health paradigms to read and interpret the nexus of poverty and mental health. And finally, I mean, I knew that I would be reading literature and case studies alike, not only to capture malady, but the wellsprings of psychic life with its unrecorded acts of survivalism, resilience, capability. And, you know, I mean, of course, I finished the book in the middle of the pandemic and, and, and the Black Lives Matter movement, you know, which brought to the fore extreme inequalities, but also, and this is something Neil mentioned, the global fight and solidarity response, inequalities entrenched and exacerbated by the pandemic. We learned about new things, you know, not just food insecurity, but how, um, in a way, um, food in insecurity during the pandemic raised the chance of anxiety 257%. We learned about digital exclusion. We learned about, um, in a way, um, the different kinds of, you know, divides, you know, and how your mortality, um, uh, uh, the, the, your chances of mortality um, increased or decreased depending on, on postcodes. I will, in the very short time I have left, try to answer some of the questions. And I really like uh, what you said, Neil, about the, the blind spot. And this is, this is exactly, you know, this is something Teju Cole writes about. He, um, in um, Unseen City, he calls the work of psychiatrists a blind spot so broad that it had taken over most of the eye. So why then is the shrink the stand-in for the novelist in, in both of his, both of the novels that I, um, that I read about, uh, that I read? Um, can one see otherwise? Can the psychiatrist see otherwise? And Cole would answer yes. You know, his character Julian's excavations of the city, excavation both in the sense of digging deep and retracing steps, helps the city confront not only repressed histories, but also to begin to mourn the bodies, you know, the forgotten bodies of the slaves, among other things. Um, to Helen's question about humanity and the humanities. So, you know, I mean, yes, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm very energized by, you know, what you said about um, the role of the humanities scholar as a broker. I'm also kind of thinking, you know, Edward Said's cautionary voice in Reflections in Exile, where he says that thinking of the literature of exile in the age of the refugee as beneficially humanistic is to banalize its mutilations. So, you know, I mean, in a way, I was very interested in literary scenes, and you mentioned Ravi Haig, Otto, um, the, the, this, this, the, the refusing to cede to literary humanism. 
uh, the insect, for instance, who wants, who is both inside, outside, uh, but also beside. You know, he's a parasite. He's in that para site. Um, and so, I mean, again, if it's a humanism, it's not the humanism of the self-governing subject, but a humanism that examines, and I'm again thinking of Nicholas Rose's work here, that examines what makes the non-sovereign subject governable by the self-governing subject. So that's the kind of humanism um, I want to, and again, you know, the other thing I want to kind of quickly add with the aesthetic education is the humanism that I, that the humanistic education that I subscribe to in this book is not based on Harold Bloom's sort of lone genius model, but it is that kind of, you know, contextualized, grounded analysis that brings to being collective creative activity, the ideas of common good and also democratic participation. Um, Peter's uh, kind of, you know, um, I, I really loved the way in which you talked about how the inside and outside are no longer sort of in a way binaries and that's that's very much an, in a way the task of the humanities is to remap um, uh, kind of you know these psychic um, categories and 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 that that is kind of you know very much the way in which I um, I see my own role in this because there were many times when and Otto asked as well and i'll try to answer this in in, in my answer to you peter um Otto asked uh, if um uh, i mean why why exactly did i choose some of the novels i did because they don't instantly um they're not really about you know the psychic lives of the urban poor and one of the reasons i chose them is because i saw in that figure of the flanio the restive figure the person who is trying to um, walk the city and, and redefine the city through walking, who wants to be nothing but pure point of view, I saw myself in that figure. I saw myself in that in that you know particular um, that 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 fantasy of pure point of view, and which is a which is a pernicious fantasy because you know I'm very much I need to sort of in a way acknowledge my own role in. I mean that's one of the reasons why I love the Teju Cole cover that it's looking at the city through what looks like a porthole, but it's actually an airplane window. And that is kind of, you know, in a way, whether or not I like it, that's my vantage point. It's my vantage point is not from the ground up. So you're absolutely right about the kind of, you know, in a way, the, the fungibility of these spaces, which I'm also having to uh, confront. I'm also having to confront, you know, the, 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 the fact that so much of my existence depends on the poor remaining poor. And so much of my existence depends on my not seeing that you know the the person who the domestic help who helps my parents comes from a slum and not from a rundown house as we like to think because every year the this person's house is flooded and her refrigerator is on top of chairs and we then have to say oh you both think she lives in a slum but until then we think we are actually participating in some sort of a very equitable labor economy where they live in a slightly worse version of the house we live in um going to kind of you know ranji's idea of you know what are the what are the two ways in which i address poverty and i would say that the two key ways and and ranji you've done such excellent work on freud's thinking about the primitive which is definitely not simplistic you know yes i mean it's a commonplace to say freud did not think the primitive had an unconscious they were the unconscious and i i too cite that but i try to complicate that because freud had very very, very deep, deep uh, respect for, for instance, the mourning practices of, of, um, of, of so-called primitive uh, civilizations. So the two ways in which I think I try to uh, reclaim poverty for psychoanalysis is kind of saying that let the subject of psychoanalysis not be a, a product of individuation, you know, this kind of the monadic subject, you know, the, the edible subject, the, the, again, going back to the, um, the slum dog paradigm, the person who escapes the 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 core of the slums to achieve the center of the center that is the call center so in one in one of the key things i want psychoanalysis to do is to a not think of the subject as individuated in a way that issues and denies the collective i also want psychoanalysis to think of the collective as having human faces and i have really tried to do that in the case studies i've tried to bring out singularities i've tried to bring out, bring out idiosyncrasies the second way i think in which I, I i think about you know um um what 
what psychoanalysis should do about poverty is, you know, I kept in touch with almost all the NGOs I worked with. And one of the things I realized is that they hadn't stopped because the poverty hadn't stopped. The person who is homeless under a tree in Chennai was still homeless under a tree in Chennai. So this idea that psychomachia doesn't cease, even if the world is shut down and we are all at home making sourdough bread, you know, I mean, and the different ways in, we, in which these initiatives were thinking on their feet, you know, um, there's one thing I read about Banyan, which is one of the NGOs I worked with in Chennai, and they've invited me back to do more work, which means I really did not screw up that opportunity. Uh, one of the really beautiful things I read about what they were doing during the pandemic is they're saying, despite all the shortages, we were trying to um, for the funerals of people who died in the rescue centers, trying to respect their last wishes. And it really like brought tears to my eyes that it's it's a grievable, mournable life, even if we don't have the resources. So that's the other thing that it doesn't cease, like psychomachia doesn't cease, intervention doesn't cease, and community psychotherapy doesn't doesn't cease. And finally, Otto's question, you know, about um about you know, you know, the inside and the outside. Yes, and the other thing, the other thing that happens outside in slums is sleeping outside, sleeping standing up outside and so much mm -hmm. of the uh, kind of in a way the common mental disorders are connected to these sort of sleep disturbances and uh, you know um what other morphology of the interior does the slum throw out you know exactly what you said you know the slum one of the first things that i realized when i was talking to uh, anthropologists and urban geographers in Haravi is that if you talk to slum dwellers they always say the slum begins outside my house so the slum is not the slum you know so this ever receding margin that you think and the slum of course it's sort of like a phobic racist classist configuration like poverty or like poor so nobody likes to say hi i'm a slum dweller you know so they always said the slum is that bit outside my home and the other thing i also constantly um noted when i was working in the slums is how beautifully polished the utensils were inside a slum habitat mm. even though the hovel itself was surrounded by dirt and and you know what i want to do the other thing the uncanny view is not that of the slum dweller the uncanny view is that of someone like me you know that of someone you know the urban geographer the national geographic the the city planner, you know, that's that's that is the kind of you know the 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 alteration between the seen and the unseen, or as Rushdi says, the city visible but unseen, and that's the thing I want to want to correct because you know I I want to kind of understand that the slum begins from outside the person's house. You know, I want to understand that these are extremely sort of user generated cities which are terribly vital. You know, they are the sort of beating hearts of kind of you know global um, economies and um, and and the last question about you know the aspirational matrix yes of course you know i mean that that is wonderful and as you know that you know i've written in the book that when the slum dog millionaire came out there were protests not on the word uh, uh, dog but on the word uh, a slum you know they, they they didn't want to they didn't want to be called you know slum slum dwellers you know and uh, so yes there is an aspirational matrix that's one of the reasons why i like catherine boo's book so much because she's completely not romanticizing the lives of the poor she's saying look they want boundaries they are fighting with each other because they each want to do better that's some of the very things that structure neoliberal liberal economies are at play there people don't want to live in that particular habitat they want to overcome it so yes that's very much there the only thing i object to in the slumdog millionaire narrative is that it's again that idea of the singular life the unique life you know that that has to escape and nothing happens to the slum that is escaped from no salutary changes are brought about in the slum that's escaped from it becomes you know this kind of you know this dark place this this sort of you know this um, black hole uh, you know etc I'll stop there. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, I think we may have reached uh, an organic um, conclusion to, to the event. And just, just let me try and sum up, if I can, what's been incredibly rich um, our 15 minutes or so. Um, perhaps it's always a serious time in history, but this feels a particularly serious time. And I want to thank the panel for conveying a sense of the status and gravity of Anki's book, um, Neil's wonderfully eloquent opening talked about Anki's intrepid willingness to address the blind spots of urban life. And I was thinking about my own experience of living in New York City as he spoke. Helen explored the humanism and its relationship to Anki's work. It's great to hear that the book is already having an impact in Sweden. Um, and she touched upon its relationship between narrative and medical humanities.
Peter called it a life work and addressed a brisk practicality of how it augments the theoretically fine honed readings and alerted us to the relationship between theory and practice. Or Ranji talked about uh, Anki's exploration of poverty in ethnographic to fictional texts and touched on the poverty of humanism itself. As always, Atto was wonderfully extemporaneously eloquent. I don't know how he does it. But domestic life in slums is conducted publicly and how, quotes, privacy is ceded to 1,000 eyes that look over the slum and make it safe. I think we'll all be thinking about phrases like that. The passion and sophistication of Anki's response to a panel as complex and rich as that is indicative of our commitment to this massive theme. It's a project that's been 10 years in development. It's a commitment that's about emotional, intellectual, professional and political. For all she's brought to the writing of this book, I think we want to register our gratitude to, us, to her and for gracing the CUP list with it. So I'm not sure if everybody can hear the applause, but let's raise our hands and honour Anki. Thank you, Anki.